manna. They seek an ambiguous meaning, losing the substance and a foolish preference for the shadow. And he will later on in this epistle say that, that, that some of these men, and he calls them out by name, Hymenaeus and Philetus, these Gnostics, they overthrew the faith of some, we'll see. And so what happens is, is as cultures begin to develop, they crave after new meanings. Uh, they, they, they look for something besides the tried and true manna. And they spiritualize the literal facts of the historical, uh, the historical resurrection, uh, verified bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and what they do is they tear out the heart of the truth of the gospel and give us the carcass stuffed with hypothesis and speculation. That's what's happening to the church. Right? <clears throat> At some point they decided to water down the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and make it not a bodily thing, make it something else, and that's why the church in America is in the condition that it's in. That's why it has a preference for so many other things when it comes to the Sunday worship. You hear, hear what I'm saying here? They tear out the heart of the truth of the gospel and give us the carcass stuffed with hypothesis and speculation. They seek for ambiguity because then they're not held accountable for what they're really made of. They're, they're held accountable for not changing into the very image that God desires for them. And so the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so vital to our understanding. The bodily resurrection of Jesus, you are his body. That's why it's important that the body of resurrection rose from the dead. That's why he said, touch me. Go ahead, touch me. Give me something to eat. You know, a flesh and bones does, you know, is not a ghost. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones. And so the resurrection of Jesus Christ is tangible proof that there is another life. There is another domain. He came from another domain into our domain and went back to another domain. And you see, if you long for something that's not in this world, it means you were made for another world. That's why this world can never satisfy you. It can never fully satisfy you. Your soul is too big. Your soul is too big for the trinkets of this planet. Everything wears out, uh, wears off after a while. You know, how many of you still have your new car smell in your old car? <laughs> right? Everything wears out, right? I know me, I'll go to the refrigerator 18 times and still not be satisfied. I don't want fried chicken, I don't want this, I don't want that. I want, what do I want? What do I want? What do we want? And there's no doubt that there is another domain for us as humans. Jesus, the man, existed after death. And his body resurrected as a pledge to us that the body will live again in a far superior condition. I know that's good news to a lot of you folks. I know it's good news to me. I'm not as old as some of you geezers, and I'm older than, than most of you. And as you know, most of us, and let me give you a public display. What was I just saying? See, that's what happens. You know, it just, things start to go wrong with your body. Now you're thinking to yourself, how far is he going to go with this little example? All I can say is I ain't what I used to be. I know, girls, you're thinking, oh, you're perfect. Huh? But he fully bore, what we have to understand in this resurrection body was that God the Father accepted his sacrifice on our behalf. It's so important to know that that body is taken up. We are the body of Christ. He is the head. We are joined as one. We have been crucified with Christ, buried with Christ, risen with Christ, and seated with Christ right now, positionally, in heavenly places. That's assurance. That's a perfect hope. That's what we have here in all this. And, he, and so the, the sacrifice took. And so the resurrection power that we have is for the purpose of living in that power, of bringing life everywhere we go through the written word of God that is so powerful to, to reach people that he haven't even, even opened the Bible like North Korea. Listen, we as a church incarnate Christ to this world. We are to live in that resurrection power so that people will look at us and say, oh, that's 
Jesus Christ. I long for that in my life. And the very fact that we long for that in our life, yes, we put that desire there. It didn't come from here, but because here doesn't have it. He placed it in me. Ecclesiastes says that he placed eternity in our hearts. You know, uh, you know, and so the world recoils at the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ because that is a threat to the status quo of the nominal Christian life. New York Times article says this. It's entitled, The Challenge of Easter. Non-believer wrote it. Reflecting on the question, why hasn't Easter and gotten into the culture and bloodstream of America the same way Christmas has. It seems everybody celebrates Christmas no matter what you believe, but not so much Easter. He goes on, the Christmas story is largely non-threatening, celebrating the birth of a good man. But in contrast, Easter is not easy to digest. The message of Easter is radical, subversive. It changes everything. In short, the resurrection makes a claim on your life. If the resurrection of Jesus happened, it is the most important event the world has ever seen. And it has claim on all of us, whether we believe it or not. And so the resurrection tells us that far more can be mended in this world and in your life than you ever even dreamed of. Because there is a power beyond anything we have experienced and we are experiencing it. But then he goes on, and look at what Paul says. Please don't adulterate the resurrection message. Please don't do it. And by the way, you're going to suffer as I have suffered. Paul is saying here, I'm an old man. I've been bitten by snakes. I've been beat up. I've been stoned. I've been whipped. I've almost drowned in the sea. I've been starving. I've done all these things. And now I'm in chains once again. This hurts. I'm tired. I'm a tired old man. And I, I've been beat up by the world, literally. One writer says this about Christian suffering. We all know that to be human is to be unfinished creatures, longing, stretching, reaching for, for, for fulfillment. We express those desires for completion in our prayer. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, uh, chapter 4, I, I think this is um, pertinent to what we're talking about here today. And he says this. He says, um, uh, looking at verse... Uh, eight, verse 8. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Also may be uh, that the life, that the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in, in us, but life in you. Do you hear what Paul's saying? Paul's saying this, everywhere Christians go, we carry about the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus might be shown to other people. Let me tell you something. When you suffer and the world watches and you go to God and say, Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. And then you say, nevertheless, thy will be done you become an expression of Jesus Christ to the world. When you suffer, and you suffer with the joy that God places in you, it is completely astounding to the watching world. Our religion is the only religion that teaches that God himself entered into human suffering willingly and eagerly to suffer with us in everything we could possibly go through. Suffering that Christians face aren't just suffering, they're birth pains, Paul says. It's suffering that produces life for others. In the resurrection of Jesus, God was transforming suffering and death itself. So suffering and death has become the way that new life is brought to others. We Christians suffer 
birth pains to bring life to the world. And what Paul is saying here is not just that death is defeated, but that death is now working backwards, dealing with suffering and death in the cause of life. What kind, here is the question when we consider these things, I, I try to say this as much as I can, read once, meditate twice. We read once, meditate twice. If you read the Bible and don't deeply consider what you're reading, it's like buying a car and never driving it. You can completely waste your time reading the Bible if you don't stop and pause and meditate and assimilate it into who you are. What kind of suffering, then, are you and I willing to enter into in order to bring life to somebody else? What are you willing to sacrifice? Paul, with all of his horrific troubles, calls his troubles light and momentary afflictions because we have a glory ahead of us so heavy it tips the scale of our heaviest affliction. That's what he says. C.S. Lewis says this. He says, in times past when people suffered, they approached God as if they were the accused, as, as if they had to answer God. But in these days, people could assume themselves to be judges and God as the accused. And let me tell you something. God refuses to justify his actions. Remember Job, why God, why God, why God? How many times have we all been there? Why God, this is not right, this is not fair. And then finally at the end, God does not give him an answer. He gives him, gives him a broader vision of himself. And he says, Job, I am not the great answer. I am the great questioner. Why do you and the nations rage against my King Jesus? We haven't come here to ask God why. We've come here for God to question us, to put us in the dark, and see if we live up to that vision of the cross that he places before our souls every day. I want to live up to that beauty. That's Christianity. It's not do's and don'ts. It's not, it's not all these uh, you know, uh, policies and doctrines and things. You know, and he goes out and he says, C.S. Lewis, we will give God a reasonable judgment if he gives us a good reason for allowing what he allows. As modern people, we start out assuming we are the judges and God is the defendant on trial. You see, we are in a relationship with a God who suffered in our place. And so don't be surprised when God pulls you into that fellowship of suffering. Pastors love to teach you, oh, in Philippians 3, oh, that we may know the power of his, rebel, of his resurrection. And he stopped there, but the second half is, and the fellowship of his suffering. Let me give you a picture, Genesis 22. Abraham is taking his son Isaac up on a hill, later be called Mount Calvary. He puts the wood on his son's back. He is the son of promise. He is the future of the people of God, this Isaac. Isaac means laughter. And he takes him up on a hill, and he's getting ready to plunge so the, the, uh, the knife into his son, and God stops him. He says, now I know you love me. You see how that felt. And you have these hurting moms groups on Wednesday, and to see the women's hearts knit together from that fellowship of suffering. You're not closest with the people you laugh with. You're closest with the, with the people you cry with. You found that to be true? Man, when you have a mutual hurt, there's a strength in that. There's a great strength in that. And so God has this way. You know, if you say, God, draw me closer, you're probably going to receive some suffering because we don't grow without suffering. There is no, depend, no closeness to God without dependence on God. And we live in the most prosperous, comfortable society in the history of the world. And I 
can't help but think sometimes that we need all kinds of discomfort and God's merciful wisdom. So faith views afflictions hopefully, knowing its purpose is to grow us and mature us in Christ. You know, I look back on my life and I see the things that, uh, that, that I hated most were absolutely benefic beneficial. When I was afflicted, David who says in his Psalms, I thank you, God, for every broken bone. I'll bet you you won't hear that in a user-friendly church, will you? Because you've got to get lots of numbers in. got to make sure we're the biggest and most hip church in town. What are the seeds filled with? Is it fruit or is it leaves? Is it a social club? Is it good for business? Is it good for marketing and pyramid deals and all these things? So the Christian, as Christians, we want to forget our weakness, but God wants us to remember it. We pray, draw me close to you, God, and His gracious response is often a form of suffering. It was God's grace to allow it in the first place. God brings good for us out of things we do anything to avoid. And I want to tell you that your cloud today is purpose filled. You want to talk about a purpose filled life or, uh, you know, yeah, that, that has great purpose in it. Great purpose in it. God brings good out of us with these things. Oh, let me tell you this too. Never estimate yourself. Never estimate yourself according to your abilities, but according to the divine resurrection power God has supernaturally put in you. Trust Him. He uses the weakest, smallest things all through Scripture, whether it's Moses as a baby in his tears, <laughs> whether it's a clay pot filled with a torch, whether it's a donkey. You know, I prove that a jackass can speak if God, you know, if God wants him to. He uses the jawbone of an ass. He uses, you know, it's just, and he does it deliberately. He uses the most unlikely people. Congratulations. You, by the world's account, are the most unlikely people to be used by God. That's what qualifies you for being used by God. You came to him with your nothingness, and he says, I can do something with that. The hardest people I have found to convince they need Jesus Christ are the religious, the moral, the successful. They just, they don't get it. They just don't get it. They think God got a good deal with them. You, you should be thankful that I don't say half the stuff that comes into my head. <laughs> I swear, I'm telling you. I, we could really have a good time. But, you know, there's people out there who get offended. Oh, especially in this culture today. I don't even know what to say. You know, my wife and I were going through the grocery store, and this really nice guy said to her, I don't even know what I can say to a woman anymore. He said, he said, uh, he said, you always look very nice when you come in here. Isn't it a shame? Isn't it a shame? We know people that work at, on college campuses and they can't say one word because the thought police comes in and just strangles everything. You know, it's nuts. And, and yet so many people are being sucked into this vortex if that's the proper use of the word, I don't know, but I like the sound of it. <laughs> but what happens is God uses our failures to turn the world upside down. He uses his own traitor, Judas, to save mankind. Suffering tends to shatter belief systems and challenge what we believe and how we define life. And so Paul in Romans 8 says, let me tell you something, we live in a world that's groaning all around us because when man fell, he was the crown of creation and he was deeply interconnected with the rest of creation so that when the crown of creation fell and rebelled against its creator, it sucked all of the universe down into the depths. And that's why all of creation's Romans 8 is now groaning, groaning for God to redeem the sons of God. To make it all right again. The grace of suffering. And all through the Bible, 
Bible, people are shocked by God's grace. Remember David and Samuel when he wanted to make the temple for God, and God and, and, he's, and God said, "No, nah, David, you're not making a house for me. I'm going to make a house out of you and your lineage." And David was just stunned, and he sat down in his living room or wherever he was, and he referred to himself in the third person. He says, "Who is David? The pipsqueak of the family, the rejected one." The eighth and youngest boy outcast from his family. God, you're gonna, you're gonna do this for me? Grace, it shocks us. And then he says, you know what? This isn't the way men treat men, this grace thing. This is not the way of man. Grace is always a surprise, folks, because we are so unlike God by nature. I had a person years back in the church, quite obnoxious, quite self-righteous. You're not here now. <laughs> it's my invisible friend, Sparky. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I say it. I should have, I should have felt it that one. But um, we had this youth event, and the kids just really were rude and nasty, and his kids were part of it. And, uh, some of mine were too. <laughs> and so I disciplined my one child for the, the disrespectful behavior. And his defense of that behavior was, well, you know, people need to earn respect. And I looked at him and I said, you know, I choose to respect you even though you haven't earned it. The fist fight ensued. <laughs> Uh, but, but it, you know, it's so unlike us. It's just so unlike us to extend grace, to receive grace. And it's interesting because the very moment we condemned Jesus to death was the very moment he was saving us. He took the ugliest, most filthy, vile act of mankind and turned it into the most beautiful act in all of history. And there's something so brave and so sacrificial in that scene that, that you want to live out the rest of your life that's true to that. That is the heart and the soul and the essence of our lives here, folks. If you're looking for something other than that, don't come here. Please, don't play games and wherever. But you're going to get the reality here. You're going to get the marrow of Christianity here, not because of me or any man, but because... We teach the Word. We don't have to figure out what to teach every week. We go through the Bible. We just teach the Word. I was listening into some user friend of the church the other day to see what's going on. There's tens of thousands of people there. The teaching, I'm thinking to myself, why are so many people rushing to listen to this nonsense? It's this tablet, this watered down nothingness. Uh, Jesus loves you. Isn't that wonderful? I'm excited to be here. You know, I wanted to slap him. Because <laughs> he didn't earn my respect. <laughs> Remember what Jesus uh, wrote personally to the seven churches, particularly Smyrna, the suffering church? Listen to this. This is in Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are of the Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. There's a lot of uh, religious Jews attacking the Christians. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now this is interesting. One of the things that Jesus does to us through the word when we suffer, and notice this is what he does with this church. First of all, he says this. I know. Oh man, do I know. 
He suffered everything man could possibly suffer, emotionally, mentally, socially, physically. And there's three themes running through this little section of the letter. The theme of resurrection, the theme of faithfulness, and then a crown of life. Let me break this down for you. Because Jesus is writing to a church that experienced, a city that experienced a, de a demolishing earthquake, Smyrna. 700 BC Smyrna was essentially demolished. It was a pile of rubble from earthquake, and it stayed in uh, rubble for 300 years. They rebuilt Smyrna as the model city of Asia Minor, a testing ground for new urban planning. And they gathered some of the best architects in the world. It was a sort of a test case. This is history, okay? If we can build Smyrna, they said, from scratch, knowing what we know today, we're always so much wiser today, what sort of city would we build? And so within 20 years, there was a war between Rome and Carthage. And Smyrna was faced with a decision. Should we be faithful to Rome or faithful to Carthage? Remember, Jesus writes to them with these three things. They chose Rome, Rome won the war, and Rome rewarded Smyrna with all kinds of stuff, and it soon became known as the crown of Asia the destination of human flourishing. They were New York, New York. If I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. It was affluent, modern, educated. The cultural elite swamped over to it. Uh, Smyrna was viewed as a crown of human living, the human flourishing, the best this world could offer. That was the cultural narrative of that city, and it was their self-understanding and social identity. Every decent Smyrna, Smyrna would have told their children all of this great pride. I grew up being told how great Johnny Unitas was in the Baltimore Colts. And we grew up teaching our children how great crabs are and obey and the Baltimore, well, we'll forget Baltimore Orioles for a little while, but it's that cultural thing, right? And so what is the story of this city? Great pride in the resurrected city, great pride in their political faithfulness, which led to it being the great crown of life, the goal of life. And so Jesus writes to this city, knowing all these things, and he says this, listen carefully in this letter. The story of your city itself, Smyrna, has been whispering my name all along. My story of final human redemption has been echoing in the streets of your Smyrna for centuries now. Can you hear my voice? Do you have ears to hear? Jesus, to all of us through this letter, is saying to that city and to us all the aspirations and desires and ambitions that you have now were intended to find satisfaction in me alone. Your cultural narrative has been a whispering my name all throughout history. And then it says this, 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're going to wrap it up shortly. 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says this. He says in verse 9, For which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of change, but the word of God is not changed. The word of God is never bound. Paul would be chained to a Roman guard 24-7. And as a result, the gospel spread throughout Caesar's palace the imperial household, and the center of power in the ancient Roman world. And let me tell you why the gospel is not bound. Because it is the voice of Almighty God. What we are listening to now has nothing to do with me, but it has omnipotence in it. It will change you into a completely new creature. A complete before you got saved. What was your thought of church before you got saved? 
Did you desire? Holy oh, yeah, Frank's back here, going. <laughs> you know what? What? <laughs> What would, would you think about opening a Bible? Would you think about telling the people about Jesus Christ? It was not there. He created something, not out of just nothing, but something from something dark and evil. There's omnipotence in these words we study. The Word of God will not die also, because when we die, we've invested in our children and our grandchildren. And they will do the same, hopefully, with theirs. The Holy, listen, the Holy Spirit is a free spirit. Remember what Jesus said in John uh, chapter 3? He said, listen, the Spirit blows wherever He wants. And to whomever He wants. And whenever, and how hard. Sometimes it's a hurricane. Sometimes it's still a small voice. So God is both powerful and tender. We're going to look at that next week in depth. And it's, I think you're really going to like some of this stuff that I make up for you to make you feel good. But anyway... And, and, and so here Paul was saying, you can chain me, but you can't chain the, chain the Word of God. And so it's interesting because um, uh, speaking about this gentleness and power and all these things, look at this in Isaiah 40, chapter 11. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. In this chapter, God is described as being clothed with an irresistible power. And then it goes on to describe him to, uh, as the, the gentleness of a shepherd. God, clothed with irresistible power, chooses to be a gentle shepherd. So much so, he came to us as a lamb. In Revelation, his favorite title for himself is the Lamb of God. And so greatness here is in league with gentleness, power with affection. Jesus gathers us to himself and he feeds us and gives us peace and he carries us in his, bo in his bosom. It is the safest place in the universe and it is also the most tender place in the universe. I want you to hear this too from Moses, the same spirit talking of course. Deuteronomy 32 verse 2. They're about to go into the promised land, and this is a reissuing of the Ten Commandments. Look at what Moses says. Let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as rain drops on tender herb, and as showers on the grass. Moses, a worker of incredible miracles, he controlled creation itself through, his, through the power of God. And yet he says, my words, my doctrine, my teaching shall come to you from heaven as a mist upon the smallest, tiniest, most fragile plant. You ever water plants and you see, I'm not good at plants, so I get the idea I'm a gardener. Don't ask me to ever water your plants at your house. They will die. They're going to die. <clears throat> but when you see that little fragile shoot, and it's just wilted, and it's flat on the ground, and it's just gasping for nutrition. And a little bit of mist hits it. It raises its head as if to say, thank you. That's what's happening here. As God is my witness, that's what happened. powerful, tender God. And there was such power and gentleness in Jesus, it seems we had, listen to this, both man and woman in the same being. This second Adam. This beginner of an entirely new race. What a thought. Jesus, head of the human race, combining his own person, all the vigor of a man and all the affection of a woman. He is, in a sense, both, if you would, the mother and the father to the children of God. And powerful demons fled at his word, and yet to him the sick came instinctively, and the children came to him instinctively, and the helpless, they were drawn to his tenderness, these small herbs of life. 
He never gives us indigestible food. Imagine life-giving mist gently falling on your souls. So, in a way, people are in our care. We're always to be considerate to the tenderest shoots, to the half-hoping, half-fearing, to the not sure yet. We're to be missed to these people. The little ones, the new shoots, they need special care. And you see, the tender plants can dry up so easily, but they, see, they can't take all of the work yet because they're too small. Remember Jesus said, I have so many things to tell you, you can't handle them now, I've got to send the Holy Spirit. Right? That's the new shoot. We've got a lot of new shoots in there. And, and you know what? The blade, as it comes up, it gets a little bit of water, and then it broadens. And then it can take a little more. And then it broadens. And then it can take a little more. That's people. That's the way we are. We would drown a doctor if it started right off the bat. And so hear once and meditate twice. Hear once and meditate twice. Go home and listen to this again. I guarantee you, you have missed several very strong points while you listen. Because you're chewing on one and something else is slipping right past you. I guarantee you, I have to listen again. Because these things are packed by design. They're packed. It's designed to strengthen the soul. Now here's the thing. In all these things, we see the superlative, paradoxical attributes of our God. And we close with this. Your life. The news. You go through trials. You go through suffering. Nothing makes sense, does it? Most of the time, none of it makes sense. We want to try to make sense of it, but that seems impossible most of the time. And the minute you start to say, oh, I know what God's doing, you have no idea what God is doing. I guarantee you. You want to make God laugh? Tell him your plans. <laughs> Tell him what you think he's doing. I had a lady in the church used to do that. She'd come up to me and she'd go, Rick, what do you think God's doing? I said, I have no idea. I don't know what I'm doing. How do you think you can get to a place where, well, me and my 14 girlfriend, yeah, that's part of the problem too. But let me suggest this. When you go, and you know, God says, I'm going to turn you into a mansion. You're going to become my sanctuary, my naos, my holy of holies. You are my building. And it looks like anything but. And so you go to a construction site where a, a, a house is being built. Now what do you see? Do you see a, you see a house or a mansion? No. You see holes and piping and unfinished works, and wood over here, and hammering, and noise, and confusion, and dust. R remember, 2 Thessalonians 1.10 tells us that in that day when he appears, he will be admired at, in his people. So when he comes back, when he's done working in your heart, when he comes back in his glorified self, the Bible tells us that is when we move into our glorified selves physically and spiritually, and it makes the whole world go, whoa, and suffering. And the power of God and the gentleness of God works it all together. Don't ever try to figure it out. You won't. Just trust. <coughs> trust in the great art, the great architect. He knows what he's doing. Peace to all of you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's have the worship team come up here. Lord, we look to you. Once again this morning, our hearts cry out for your great justice and your truth. There is a battle for truth in our country, for decency, for unity, for 
we're sane and sober look at ourselves and the things around us, Lord. Keep us from drifting. We tend to drift. We love you, Father. I pray that anyone here, please, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, please make him your Savior. Commit yourself to him wholeheartedly. And I tell somebody that you know. And if you would like to pray or have prayer of, of some uh, form, uh, we'll sing two songs. And during the first song, you come down, pray for these folks by the double door. <clears throat> and the usher's going to take up an offering. And Father, we pray, Lord. We pray, Father, for generous hearts. You can tell a lot about a person and their walk with God by their pocketbook, by their checkbook. Not sex walks, money talks. The old saying, actually a different word to use, but word church, so. Put your money where your mouth is. God has a way of saying, I gave all you have to you freely. How do you respond? So we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Amen.